Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Words taken from the gospel for this 22nd Sunday after Pentecost in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. After Moses died, Joshua led the people of God, the Israelites, into the promised land. Directed and aided by God through St. Michael. This great man conquered all the pagan kings and their kingdoms. And so, as long as they did not sin, they were unconquerable. No matter how strong, no matter how numerous, or how united against them were the opposing forces. In chapter 12 of Joshua, we read about all the kings and kingdoms that fell before him. There were 31 in all. That is an amazing number of kings and kingdoms for such a small geographic area. They were obviously not very united, except if you read the book, when trying to defeat Joshua. That was the only thing that could unite them. But Joshua brought true unity to the land with the true religion, with its one temple and law. Book of Joshua. Now, the life of Joshua, including this chapter 12 of Joshua, are types or prefigurements of the future. Joshua means Jesus, Savior. He leads the people of God into the promised land flowing with milk and honey. Just as His Majesty Jesus Christ opens the way for us to enter heaven through His ascension. Joshua conquered a land deeply divided, yet perfectly united against him. This is seen by the presence of seven nations in the promised land, yet they all had broken up into many kingdoms. But there were seven nations, the Hittites and Amorites and all that stuff. Now, the fathers tell us the nations, the seven nations stand for the seven capital vices. Remember them? Pride, lust. Envy, greed, gluttony, sloth, and anger. These have to be completely conquered in each soul and in each country. And only Joshua, only Jesus can do this. Seven is the number of perfection, meaning the nations opposing Joshua were perfectly united against him. Now, this type is fulfilled when our Lord became man and was born of the Blessed Virgin Mary in Bethlehem. At that time, the land was again deeply divided, as St. Luke points out in chapter 3 of his gospel. Remember, he says there are two high priests, Annas and Caiaphas. He says also that there are the Romans under Tiberius Caesar and Pontius Pilate. And he said there were four little kingdoms, one of which was governed by Herod. This division, if you understand what I'm trying to say, this division is on display in our blessed Lord's passion. Recall how much effort it took to get the death sentence for his majesty. He passed in and out of four separate courts, and one could even argue five courts. He went to Annas, then to Caiaphas, then to Pilate, then to Herod, and then he was presented in the court of the people, and they said, crucify him. They made their judgment. They passed the sentence. And so the account of his trial takes up the majority of the gospel history of the passion, showing you the incredible divisions present at that time. In the gospel for today, we see a few signs of this too. The various forces that did not agree with each other. In fact, in some ways, they hated each other. Namely, the Pharisees and the Herodians, they teamed up against his majesty. The Pharisees were legalistic, religious-minded, strict Jews. While the more politically-minded Herodians were dedicated to King Herod, thinking perhaps he might be the Messiah. Soon, the worldly Sadducees would also join them, as well as the lawyers These groups were always divided and at each other unless it was about stopping the new Joshua who was conquering the land. Hmm. 
The question in the gospel about Caesar came up today. It was actually Tuesday of Holy Week. They asked this question. The dark hour of the passion was approaching and they were running out of ideas with which to confound his majesty. And so the question or dilemma they themselves argued over for so long was put to his majesty, namely the thorny matter of the relationship between church and state, between religion and politics. His majesty answered perfectly as always, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. But what is Caesar's and what is God's? Man is made by God. We are his creatures. Only God can make the soul of man and infuse it into his body at his conception in the womb. We came from God and we will return to God at least to be judged. Listen to St. Paul. This is from Romans. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto God, unto the Lord. Or whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and rose again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Thank you, St. Paul. We belong to God willy-nilly. Can't get away from it. And we must render to him as due our souls, our wills, our bodies. Listen to St. Hilary, doctor of the church, father of the church. We are bound to render unto God the things of God, our body, our soul, and our will. For the coin of Caesar is in gold in which his image is engraven, but God's coin is man in whom is the image of God. St. Bernard adds, render unto Caesar the penny which has Caesar's image. Render unto God the soul which he created after his own image and likeness. And ye shall be righteous. Now, just as the soul is more important than the body, it lives on. The body dies and rots. Just as the soul is immortal then, whereas the body dies, so too the church is higher than the state. The mystical body of Christ is higher than the state. No kidding. That's not what people think today, though. So, too, then, is theology higher than political science or any science. Just as the church is higher than the state, so is theology, the science of the sacred, higher than political science, the science of the state. So, too, the church is immortal. Well, the state eventually must end It's going to die. Just as the soul gives life to the body, so too the state receives life from the church. This is why the governments or states of the world are supposed to help both the church and the soul. Its citizens reach their final end by removing any temporal blockages that stand in the way. That's the job of the state. A couple of simple historical examples. The state is to make Sunday a day of rest, wherein everyone can attend Holy Mass. Now, although the government cannot make us go to Mass, they should make it possible for everyone to be able to go. How? By outlawing unnecessary business on that day and keeping the roads open, obviously. Another example is divorce. It was, once upon a time, illegal, unless it was proved that the marriage was invalid to begin with, something only the church could determine. And so the state is to occupy itself with things temporal, making sure that none of them block the way to things eternal. That's the job of the state. Yet down through time, over and over again, the state or political leaders and their governments have risen up against the church to dominate. There's an inversion that goes on. They rise up to dominate the church, to oppose it, always tending toward nationalizing the church, making it a part of the state or under the state. Thus, we had Gallicanism in France, Josephism 
after Emperor Joseph II in Austria. We had Febronianism in Germany. And now what is going on in China could be easily classified as this as well. Right now in China, trying to nationalize the Catholic Church. Some states or governments like the Romans of old or Nazi Germany or Japan tried to make the state itself and its leader the religion of the day. They were the new Herodians. I'm a God, worship me. This is your religion, the state. That's what they did. Communist Russia went even further and made it clear that they wanted to conquer not only their own country, but also the whole world and do away with religion to make everyone communist. And this is why they had the third communist international and the motto, workers of the world unite. Unite against who? The Christ. This is also why Our Lady of the Rosary said at Fatima, Russia would spread her errors unless the Pope and the Catholic bishops of the world united to counteract it by way of making a consecration of Russia to Mary's Immaculate Heart. Theology is higher than political science. We must fight it at the level of theology. Consecrate. Note, by the way, all these governments, once in full power, tried to block all things religious. So, for example, in Russia, Sunday was out. They formulated new work weeks and new calendars and made it dangerous to attend Mass. They did away with marriage laws and so on, legalizing divorce so that they could control individual lives and their bank accounts, as well as where to educate children. Russia indeed has spread her errors. This is what they're doing now. Our government loves divorce because they can get into your lives and your bank accounts and control your children where they go to school. It's communism. When we study false religions, it shows up time and time again that they too are seeking to overcome the world. Something that has only been given by God to the Catholic Church alone to accomplish. His majesty commanded us for all time at the end of Matthew's gospel. Going therefore, he said, teach ye all nations. He didn't say all peoples and all persons. He said all nations. Go out there and teach ye all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them, that is, all nations, to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. The church is higher than any state or all states combined. And this is one of the reasons why we're called Catholic. That is universal. I'm currently listening to an interesting expose on Scientology. It's very interesting. Not surprisingly, it's wicked founder L. Ron Hubbard, who, by the way, started his career as a religious founder by committing adultery, falsifying a marriage, and absorbing the writings of the Satanist Aleister Crowley. Great founder. Yep, L. Ron Hubbard wanted to overtake the world using his ideas and writings as, as it were, sacred scripture inspired They all want to do that. How about Islam? Islam makes it very clear that they want to conquer all nations and subject them to the Quran. Thus, allowing them into any country will only bring yet more division, guaranteed. Mormons go all over the world seeking to Mormonize everyone they come across. They're in our own neighborhoods. For those with eyes to see and ears to hear, the 12th chapter of Joshua also represents our times. When the world has grown small under modern technological advances of travel and communication. But oh, how very divided we are. Just like those little kingdoms of old. Laboring under false principles of enlightenment and French revolution, which demand the separation of church and state. Which is an evil. It's against the way God made things. We also have the so-called United Nations that are anything but united. If anybody knows anything about that group, they only seem to be united on one thing. 
the very same thing with which the kings falling under Joshua were united. The same that united the Pharisees, the Herodians, the elders, the Sadducees. They were all against everything of Jesus Christ. How right was the great Russian novelist Dostoevsky in saying in his allegory, The Grand Inquisitor, these pitiful creatures that is man are concerned to find something that all would believe in and worship, that all may be together in it. This craving for community of worship is a fundamental secret of human nature. Dostoevsky's right. But this thing that unites what they're going to end up with is the lowest common denominator, the state. When this happens, an antichrist is not far away. In other words, political science becomes your theology. The state becomes your God and your religion. Now, some serious lessons fall out from this. First of all, we should be thankful we're Catholic. We're in the right place. We should stay united in the midst of this great trial we're in. How much it behooves us to stay united and not let silly little differences break us apart. You know, they say about trads that if you want to form a firing line to take out an enemy, they turn and shoot each other. How true that is. They form a circle. We'd rather shoot each other than fight the enemy. We need unity. Not get involved in these silly little differences that people bring up. We have what it takes for unity. Second of all, when the church is separated from the state, its demise is sure to come. Not the church, but the state. As everyone knows, the death of a body involves the various parts of that body decaying, disintegrating into their individual elements. Thus, it is only the soul that can keep a body alive, uniting and harmonizing that body to make it one. In other words, there is no unity in any state, any government, any country, any geographic region or the world as a whole that will last unless it has God uniting it. No political system will unify unless, key point, via negativa, Unless it is unified against God. That's how a lot of these governments have kept going. Because they're united against one thing. We're against everything of God or his Christ. And the church that he established. And thus they keep going in some ways. And they fall apart eventually. Anything but God. They repeat that phrase from the gospel. We will not have this man reign over us. Seems to be the motto. But as history clearly shows, such false unions are deeply divided and doomed to disintegrate. They may achieve some level of unity for a time, such as that produced by the brute force or by fear as the communists employed. But it will not last. What a grace it is to be Catholic. We should stay with the church come what may. Third of all, this also means that when the state rises up to dominate the church, we should expect to see a few things. Number one, people will tend to view politics and political leaders as saviors, as the Herodians viewed Herod. This is important to understand in this election year. I do admire our current president. And I plan on voting again this year to help him limit the evil of revolution as much as possible. To vote for those who will not fight against God and his church as much as I'm able to determine. But I also know that no man can help us out of this fix until God send us another Joshua like man to conquer the world anew with St. Michael. People who look for political saviors are only paving the way for an antichrist to arise because they will be forever looking for some future leader to solve their problems instead of getting on their knees and praying for God to God to send some Christ like figure, a great pope and a great king, maybe that's been prophesied. If nothing else, for Christ, the king of kings to return and conquer all nations 
As it says in the Bible, all nations will come and adore him. Now note, some of these same people will also treat the church leaders as political, even saying when they should resign or not, as if they have that power to tell a pope or anybody, you should resign. What arrogance! What a shameful place we're in now. Treating theology like political science. Treating the pope like an elected official. This is not something we can do. It's not within our power to say these things. It shows you how bad, how degenerated we've come to apply political theory to theology. That's what's happening. It's shameful. Second of all, this inversion of state over the church also leads to science dominating theology, as just said, which is what we have today. People will ridicule the tenets of faith and theology using things that claim they claim to be scientific to discount them. Thus, we have the rise of evolution in every sphere of life and study. Evolution, the prevailing philosophy of our times. This was predicted. Once again, we turn to the great Russian novelist Dostoevsky. He wrote in the late 19th century. He makes this point in the discussion on the relationship between church and state in the Brothers Karamazov. Excellent book overall. He said, according to modern thinkers, the church ought to be transforming itself into the state. From a lower to a higher species. That's evolution. From a lower to a higher species. The higher species, according to them, is the state. The lower species is the church. That's an inversion. It's a diabolical disorientation. And he said that it should disappear into the state eventually, making way for science, the spirit of the age and civilization. And if it does not want that, the church resists and offers resistance, then as a result, it is allotted only a certain corner, relegated to the sidelines, as it were, in the state, and then put under its control. See evolution at work here. The inversion. Evolution will tell theology what to think. Fourth lesson, fourth lesson. Since theology is higher than political science by its very nature, that is, theology is vertical, political science is horizontal, then we should expect false religions after false religion and their various leaders to rise up and try to reestablish the proper order. Sad to say, the ones who are most likely to do this, in other words, put theology back on top, are who? Not the Catholics, the Muslims. They're going to make the Quran the book of the world if they're given the chance. They'll do it too. And they make no bones bones about it. They're going to do it unless God intervenes. With the true church once again going through a crisis and being discredited all over the world, We must not give way to the temptation to hand over to Caesar what is God's. Once again, listen to the great Russian novelist Dostoevsky make the point way back in the 19th century by recounting a French high security official saying this. This should strike home with us. We are not afraid of all those socialists, anarchists, atheists, and revolutionaries. We keep an eye on them and their movements are known to us. We've got them figured out. We know what they're about. But he says, but there are some special people among them, although not many. These are believers in God and Christians. And at the same time, socialists, revolutionaries. They are the ones we are most afraid of. They are terrible people. A socialist Christian is more dangerous than a socialist atheist. Thank you, Fedor Dostoevsky. Well said. Let us avoid this ourselves by always rendering to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Let us keep the various spheres where they're meant to be. Let us not confuse theology and political science. Let us not confuse church and state. Let us give to God the things that are God's. All the while knowing that a Joshua-like man prophesied to come will surely come. And bring the long for unity that only God can grant. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.